Hi guys, Barnaby for Spurred On. This is your regular Tuesday edition of Spurberts, this time with added Greg Stobart from Squawker. Greg, how are you? I'm very good, thanks, Barnaby. Good man, Greg, is our transfer guru, the man in the know about all things transfer. So we'll be talking about that, that later on, but also we'll be starting by talking about the Everton game and uh, how Vincent Janssen and Victor Wanyama performed. We're talking about Christian Eriksen's contract. Juve may be interested in him. We're we'll talking about the Paul Mitchell affair and uh, how that affects the Nkudu and Njai deals. Uh, Gary Neville has come out and said that he thinks Deli Ali could be as good or better than Paul Pogba this season. We'll be talking about Danny Drinkwater rumours. Uh, is that something we're interested in? I'm not so sure. And finally, we'll be talking about DeAndre Yedlin. Will he stay with the squad or will he go? But let's get started by talking about the Everton game. Of course, it was Everton 1, Spurs 1 on Saturday at Goodison Park. What were your overall feelings about it uh, at the end? It felt like a point drop for Tottenham at the end, didn't it? But when you look at the first half, I thought that was really disappointing. Mm -hmm. The way Spurs had played against Inter Milan, playing against an Everton side that didn't seem to be ready, even Ronald Koeman said they were only 70%. Such a disappointing first half. Showed the character to respond, which Maurizio Pochettino has been asking for. But really, if Spurs want to win the league this season, which Pochettino still says he does, you need to be finishing it at the end. Those couple of chances at the end, great save by Stecklenburg, two great, two great saves, saves yeah, yeah. by Stecklenburg. You look at Man City and Chelsea, they managed to sneak late victories this weekend and that's what Tottenham need to do if they're going to win the title. I think that's a good point. Do you think, this is a difficult one to ask, but do you think, uh, obviously, yeah, Man City and Chelsea and Man United under Jose, they got those wins. Do you think they would have got those wins away at Everton? I feel like Everton is one of those places, like I said, I think in my post-match review, I think bigger teams who've spent more money will struggle there. Um, and I think a point at Everton is probably a good point. Yeah, really? even, even last season when they were very poor at home, they still performed better in those big games. But I think it was a good time to play Everton. Yeah. I think from a Spurs point of view, that's a disappointment. They weren't ready. We're seeing them. Ashley Williams wasn't playing. They signed Balassi after the game. Wasn't playing. Yeah, if you're going to play, no Lukaku, exactly. If you're going to play them and beat them, it was a really good time to play them yeah. because they weren't ready. And that's why Everton were really holding on in the last 15, 20 minutes. They weren't fit. They weren't sharp enough. Mm. And I thought Tottenham would just bulldozer them, to yeah. be honest. I didn't think they'd be ready for the whole game. And they just started a little bit flat. Second half, much better, especially when Janssen yep. came on. All in all, Spurs got a point there last year. Yeah. Haven't lost an awful lot, but really think slight missed opportunity. But yeah, 37 games to go, mate. So. 37 games to go. If we get a point in each of those games, we will get relegated. So let's not <laughs> think about it like that. It doesn't make sense. That was stupid. Uh, what I would say is obviously uh, a year ago away at Man United on the opening day, we were very disappointed after not getting a result there, even though we played well. And, you know, I think... We'll see that as a good point if we get the win against Palace this Saturday, realistically. Four points from the first two games going into the Liverpool game, I think it would be decent. Yeah, what you don't want is the way Tottenham started last season, which was drawing too many games and yeah. the way they finished last season as well. So you've got to get rid of that negative momentum from yeah. the last four games of last season and you've got to get that win under the belt. I mean, Pochettino still says Spurs didn't lose the title because of the last month of the season. They yeah. lost it in the first six weeks when That's they were drawing true, yeah. too many games. So. Didn't win in our first four games, did we? Yeah, so they've got to put that right. Palace at home, perfect opportunity, but got to win. OK, and you alluded to it before. We thought Victor uh, Vincent Janssen played well. And what did you make of Victor Wanyama, the two signings? Yeah, bit rash in the first half, Wanyama, but grew into the game. It was was that a foul for the, their goal? Was it a foul, did you think? Yeah, it was. I mean, it, in Premier League terms these days, it's a foul. It wasn't a horrible one, was it? It was no. a little bit unlucky. Seemed a little bit rash in the first half. A bit like all of them, slightly behind, off the pace, a yard off the pace. But second half, I thought it was really interesting that Pochettino decided to bring off Dyer and keep Van Yammer on because even watching the game, you would have thought mm. Dyer better on the ball as well, more yeah. of a ball player. But it was really interesting. And, and better uh, at uh, attacking set pieces as well. I, I wondered, do you think Dyer was? He, uh, Pochettino felt Dyer was a bit leggy, getting a bit tired. Yeah, well, they all did, didn't they? Yeah. Dyer. I mean, Kane. If you're talking about the disappointments, it was Harry Kane barely had a touch. Christian Eriksen was really, really poor. It's weird because he didn't play in the summer, Christian Eriksen. And I felt as well, in the, uh, well, more in the Atletico game, uh, he, uh, over in Australia, in those matches, Juve and Atletico, he looked leggy, actually, Christian Eriksen. His touch was off a bit as well. Yeah, it's always been a bit of a problem with him, that inconsistency. But it's not even game to game. It's sort of, he does it in three or four month chunks, doesn't he? Last season, he started a bit slow as well. Mm. And then second half of the season, after Christmas, he was absolutely yeah. superb. When he scored the winner at City, etc. Yeah. yeah, he was superb in the second half of last season. Like you said, he's had a full pre-season, so you would have thought mm. that he'd be really on the pace, but he didn't look it. I mean, him, Ali and Kane were all disappointing for me. Yeah, I think with Harry, it's interesting, I've said this before, but I think it's interesting when he's not scoring, and obviously it's only been one game, but if you think about the Euros as well, 
when he's not scoring, he kind of looks heavy and a bit like a cart horse. But as soon as he gets a goal, he's buzzing. And I think what we've got to hope is, unlike last season where he didn't score for eight games, if he gets one ideally early on Saturday, it might set him off. Yeah, I think so. I mean, he didn't have a chance on no. Saturday, did he? And Neither did he in the Euros. Yeah, really. that's, that's the problem with Kane, because he's not the kind of player who's going to get the ball in the halfway line and skip past three players. He needs the service, he needs it yep. in the box. Maybe lacking a bit of sharpness. I mean, they, the England boys haven't had that much time, really. I mean, they only had one friendly, yeah, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, Inter the was their first friendly, so they're probably a couple of weeks off and it showed. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, Vincent Janssen, uh, we were discussing before, excellent, to me, an excellent target man in terms of his back-to-goal play bringing other players in and also running the channels really surprised me against Everton. That first thing he did where he got to the byline and pulled it back, excellent. Well, it's really encouraging because he was much better against Everton than he was in any of the friendlies, I think. He, encouraging against Inter as well. But yes, yeah, the work rates, the attitude, yeah. he was winning the ball back, really putting him under pressure. And he came on when Tottenham were looking flat and needed to up the tempo. Massive backside, really puts himself around. Yeah. You're right, first thing he did, nice touch, cross into the box. Should have scored. Yeah. Should have scored. Really it was good a bit under his it was stuck under his feet a bit. It was a good touch, but he was he had a man coming in there and a man behind him. So I felt he did well to get the shot off, but let's face it, I think fifteen out of twenty Premier League keepers wouldn't have stopped that. It was a great save. Oh, it was a fantastic save. I mean, you look back on it, you think smash it a little bit harder, mm. but the goals will come if he puts that effort in. Yeah. I think he'll probably be substitute again at the weekend, but he's yeah. probably unlucky already when you talk about the way Harry's playing. If Janssen's sharp when he's playing like that in training, I don't think too many Spurs fans would be too upset to see him start at the weekend. Yeah, yeah, be interesting. OK, so let's move on to uh, the next topic of today's Spurverts and Christian Eriksen's contract. Now, uh, obviously, I think by now, last time we spoke a few months ago, we were talking about how we kind of expected the Ericsson contract, the Lamella contract, maybe the Lloris contract to be done by now. And you were saying that Levy was working very hard on those. Uh, nothing really has been heard about that since, and now obviously Ericsson's agent has been yab yab yabbing, and Christian has had to kind of release Instagram posts saying, "Don't believe everything you hear in the press." So, you know, what are your thoughts on the latest on that? It's interesting because Spurs thought towards the end of last season they were nearly there with Ericsson. The big concern was then was to get Pochettino's contract sorted, and they thought the rest yeah, would, would naturally follow. follow. But it hasn't quite happened like that, has it? Really. I think he will sign mm. eventually, but he's in a strong position after the season Spurs had and he had last year with interest from other clubs and with two years left. And everyone knows you can't let a top player go into the last two years of their contract. Yeah. So he's not asking for £150,000 yeah, a week. Weird. But Was that his agent putting that out there to kind of almost, dare I say it, wind Tottenham up and try and you know push it along? I think so a little bit. We know Daniel Levy is a fierce negotiator. And I think Levy realises he's got to break the wage structure, but can you do it for every single player? Right. And it's structuring those kind of deals. So the highest earners at the moment are Moussa Dembele and Hugo Lloris, who are both si both signed contracts fairly recently, mm -hmm. seventy five to eighty thousand pounds a week. Mm -hmm. But now that's, that's less than Adebayor was on. So we're you know we're saving money. From, yeah. and, and like your Paulinho's, they, he probably wasn't up there, but we did get a lot of those big earners off the wage bill. Yeah, and the money's there. And I think when when you're talking about the transfer fees. Spurs budget, I think a lot of that's going to be siphoned off to first the stadium and second the new contracts, which are the priority. Christian Eriksson is only on £35,000 a week. Yeah. So you could say that Spurs have been saving money the last couple of years because he's worth an awful lot more yeah. than that. If he was at most clubs in the Premier League, he'd be earning more than that. I think it'll get done for around £80,000 a week. Spurs have to push it over the line, though, because we know if he starts to run down his contract, they're going yeah. to have to listen to offers. And rumours are that Juventus are sniffing around and they were, they were talking about... Inter as well. It strikes me as an odd one it, that he would ever go to Italy at this point. I don't think that would happen. The Juventus interest is pretty long term. That's been around for a couple of years, but I think they signed a couple of pretty similar players. Pjanic they signed yeah, top in, the, in the summer. Yeah. So I don't think they're looking, there's not a hole in that Juventus squad for an Ericsson type player mm. right now, but they have been tracking him for a couple of years. And the thing is, if he does start to run down his contract, a lot of clubs will be looking at it as a bargain. Yeah. You know, Spurs got him were relative in yeah, the last like nine it, million, wasn't it? Yeah, it was about eleven million when he came got down to the last year of his contract. So he actually has history for running down his contract, yeah, going does. and going for a cheap fee. So that'd be the worry for Tottenham. And you know, if you're Inter or Juventus or whoever else might want him, you can get him at a cut down price, and then the day after you sign him, he's worth an awful lot more money. So it's yeah. almost tactical in that sense. Well, I think I've said this before, but that's one of the things I've heard about Christian. Maybe read a few things about it as well. Is that he's always had a quite a, a plan in his mind. He could have gone to bigger clubs 
even before I think he went to Ajax. He could have gone to, I know Chelsea were sniffing around him and big clubs uh, while he was at Ajax, but he's always had this kind of idea that he wants to settle into a new league uh, and, and really make his career go up in stages and Tottenham was the right club for him. So do you kind of feel, this is how I feel, that maybe he will sign the new deal, um, it'll be like a four or five year deal and then maybe after a couple of years of that, a big club. I think he. I think I heard he supports Barcelona or something. He would like yeah. that kind of Modric-esque big move to one of the big Spanish clubs, perhaps. I think he might even be on record from when he was a teenager saying Barcelona mm. was his dream. I don't think any Spurs fan would argue with, play, with a player going to sure. Real Madrid or Barcelona. They've seen it happen. You're right. I think a couple of years, he's still improving and learning. That's the thing. He's got yeah. a lot better even since he joined Tottenham. He's still young. Yeah. You know, in, a, in two or three years' time, that's when he's hitting his peak. He's playing for a Champions League club this season. Absolutely no reason to leave. I think he's on the record saying he's very happy yeah. as well. So I think, like you said, I think he'll sign four or five year contract, but after a couple of years, he'll look yeah. to move on. And then we make the money as well and he gets his and move. Spurs are sensible, they know. So they're already looking at that kind of player, potential replacement. Yeah. You talk about players like Eunice Malley or Ante Koric, who's a really exciting young player. Yeah, he's at the Croatian, Sokra. isn't he? He's almost your like for like. So you almost get him in. And if Ericsson moves on, he's straight in. Interesting. Good stuff. OK. Let's move on to Paul Mitchell now, of course. Uh, Paul Mitchell handed in his resignation a week or so ago. Uh, it was accepted by the club. I don't think they could do much about that. But he is staying on to work this transfer window uh, at least. Uh, you have a bit of uh, inside information, but uh, you know, what are your thoughts over it well, uh, there's, overall? There's been a lot of rumours and talk and guessing a little bit, I guess, about this one. First thing I'd say, I went to Maurizio Pochettino's press conference last week, and he was really really annoyed, really mm. disappointed, but with Paul Mitchell. Yeah. He wasn't annoyed with Daniel Levy or the club for forcing Mitchell out. He was annoyed with Paul Mitchell. He that seemed, go, and that goes against what I think the press are trying to spin on this one. Yeah, Pochettino seemed really upset that Mitchell had almost walked out on him a little bit. Paul Mitchell was telling people at the club, firstly he's saying that he hasn't got another job lined up because the few suggestions that, that Leicester Lester, had yeah. already made an approach. I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up there, but he's saying point blank, no, I haven't had an offer, it's not lined up. And he's also not bad-mouthing Daniel Levy, which is quite interesting. He's, yeah. very, he's at pains not to say anything bad. He's one of the few people in football not bad-mouthing Daniel yeah. Levy, which yeah. is good. But, you know, where's, where's the truth? It's probably somewhere in there because the fact is he had a great job, his dream job a couple of years ago, and he's saying he's really unhappy and for his own happiness he has to walk out. He's suggesting he can't do his job exactly how he wants to. So there's obviously been something that's gone on there between Paul Mitchell and the board. I think Mitchell, longer term, would have liked a director of football role yeah. as well. Maybe that's got something to do with it. But frankly, the structures are in place. The manager's the most important person. Daniel Levy is always going to want to take control of the transfer deals, along with Rebecca Capelhorn. And what's her, what's her job? She's head of, head operations. of football operations. Yeah. So she, she does a lot of the negotiating um, for transfers. She's basically the line manager for a lot of the st scouting staff as well. So she's got a really big role. She's quite a tough well, character as well. What's her background? Do you know? She used to work for QPR. Um, she well, was, that went well. Yeah, she was financial director there oh as well. <laughs> so, but uh, presumably, was that under Tony Fernandez or before then? Uh, both, I think. Certainly under wow. Fernandez. Spurs got her from QPR. But she's very well respected. She's very good. A lot of people say you know, she's been hard, pretty impressive there. Hard so. taskmaster yeah. along with Levy. Yeah, so I don't think it's the end of the world for Tottenham. I mean, you look at who Mitchell's actually signed since they came in. I think Alderweireld was a no-brainer. Really. they already knew him. Kevin Vimmer, I guess, is, yeah, the nice. is the success. But, you know, Vincent Janssen, for example, he was a top scorer in Holland with 27 goals last yeah. season and he cost 400,000 a week, a year ago, sorry. Yeah. So it's if, not if like he'd he, been that good, we'd have got him a year ago. Is yeah, that what you're saying? He, well, he didn't pluck him from nowhere, did he? That's, no, 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 the, that's, that's the point. True. We haven't that's seen true. any really of these hidden Paul Mitchell that's true. gems so far. So I think the, I don't think they're particularly worried about losing yeah. him. Yeah, I think the most important thing coming out of all that, which is fascinating information, is that Pochettino isn't angry with Levy. That, I think, is what a lot of Spurs fans were worried about, that Pochettino might see this as like the first step in Daniel Levy not doing you know, things the way that he wants it to do. And, and obviously, Pochettino is the key, I think, for Spurs. Yeah, Pochettino signed his five-year contract. He's got this new title. He's manager now, not head coach. Yeah. Spurs are completely committed to Pochettino now. They know they've struck gold. This, was, this is the manager that yeah. Daniel Levy's been trying to get yeah, since yeah. he bought the club 15 years. And finally... He's got him. He's absolutely perfect for Tottenham. For a start, he doesn't need to spend money. He doesn't even like yeah. spending money, which is perfect for Daniel Levy as well. And Pochettino will, maybe he'll even get more say on the transfers now. Yeah, I that's think true. 
you know, I think Paul Mitchell's obviously become frustrated. The Nkudu thing's an example of yeah, Daniel. Daniel Levy still medals, let's be honest. He still does it, but I don't think it's the end of the world that Mitchell's gone. Yeah, so that brings me on to how do you think it's going to affect this Nkudu thing? I read this morning that Nkudu is in London eating porridge in a hotel. Uh, I don't know if that's half joke or whatever, but, you know, is that going to go through? Obviously, Levy is renegotiating this deal. What, what, what do you think is going to happen? And, and with Njai as well. It's interesting that he's still in the hotel because... He's been in the hotel for about three weeks oh, now. I, I, I assumed he might have gone back to Sounds France. Sounds expensive. <laughs> yeah, I'm assuming yeah. this isn't a travel lodge. Yeah, I mean, he passed his medical weeks ago. The deal was all agreed. Obviously, the changes in the at boardroom level at Marseille yeah. haven't helped things at all. And at Spurs, obviously. Yeah, and I think Spurs have had second thoughts. I think Paul Mitchell might have led the negotiations hmm. on that one, and that might have something to do with his disappointment. Spurs are trying to renegotiate the terms slightly. They say that Marseille have become more difficult. Right. Marseille say Spurs have completely moved the goalposts. Marseille want more. Spurs want to pay less. Good luck. Yeah, I, th- I think one of the worries is Spurs agreed this deal and then everyone started saying, guys, he's not that good. Right. Um, and That doesn't fill me with hope. <laughs> well, a lot of people in France who you speak to say he's no better than Clinton NG, who from day one, Maurizio Pochettino was a bit worried about him even in training because he was being outperformed by some of the academy players. So right. Spurs need pace, they need a winger. So, yes, I mean, if Nkudu's the man they've identified and he's a good price, they've got to go for it. And I think that's where you back your manager and you back your head of recruitment. If you're Daniel Levy, you get that over the line. God, you say you need a wing. I mean, I have to say we're quite, you know, it's quite easy in the end that we got rid of Andros and Andros did well when he got game time at Newcastle. Was the thing with Andros that, you know, he'd obviously had that falling, you know, he, his frustration had got the better of him and Pochettino felt that was an attitude thing. A little bit attitude and also performances. He wasn't playing. I think yeah. he said himself last week that he wasn't playing he very well. That, he yeah. wasn't playing very well for. But Tottenham. can you play? I'm mean, oh, getting off topic here. But can you play that well when you're not getting three, four, five games in a row? You're just getting substitute appearances, or you know, should you just take that substitute appearance, and make yourself like Harry Kane did back in the day, make yourself absolutely indispensable? It's difficult. It's difficult, and a lot of it depends on the character of the player. Someone like Hyunmin Son. You get the sense that he doesn't like being a substitute, and he can't get into the game when mm. he comes on. He needs, he needs yeah. to start. Other players. Chadley at times mm. comes on a substitute I mean, and he scores goals and he has well, good. Do you know what I'd say? The thing is though, that's interesting you say that because immediately I feel the thing is, is with Sonny is you're right, he doesn't do well when he comes off the bench, but his attitude is good all the time, seems happy, yeah. really part of the team. Whereas with Chadley, you know, he's, he has scored, I suppose, off the bench a bit, but you get the sense with him and also uh, I feel like he's probably on his way now, but yeah. you get the sense with him that really he thinks he should be in that team and he's, he deserves better. And that's the whole, that's part of the recruitment process, it's the profiling of the player. And yeah. I think it's one of the things that they worried about with Batshawi, who ironically ended up on the bench yeah. at Chelsea. Yeah. How's he going to cope with being substitute? They knew that Vincent Janssen would come and work his work yeah. his balls off yeah. every game and give it 100% and he would make sure that he was in the team and he's shown that attitude already. Yeah. Whereas another player might think they're more entitled to get in the team. So, so presumably Janssen is probably on about 50 grand less than yeah, Batshuayi yeah. was hundred thousand pounds a week would have made him our top earner. Yeah. So. Okay, so uh, next up, uh, after uh, Monday Night Football last night, Gary Neville, uh, obviously formerly uh, assistant manager of England, worked with them in the Euros, uh, waxed lyrical about Deli Alley. He really went off on one about how excited he is about Deli Alley, even suggesting uh, that it'll be interesting to see how much influence he has compared with Pogba, Paul Pogba at Man United. Uh, it's good to hear, isn't it? I didn't see that, but really interesting. I mean, you look back to that France friendly, England against France, when Ali scored that great goal, and he monstered Pogba in that game. Mm. I think in the lead up to his goal, he snapped, almost snapped Pogba in half yeah, with yeah, a sliding, yeah. Incredible tackle, with a sliding yeah. tackle. I think Pogba's got the extra experience, hasn't he? And that's the difference. I think Delhi's still a little bit inconsistent. I don't think he didn't have a good Euro. He didn't. Dif- difficult ending to last season yeah. with the suspension as well. I think Pogba would have had a bad Euros if he was under Roy Hodgson as well. Though, yeah, I'd yeah. That. I think that's part of it. You don't just the talent Ali's got. Amazing. You just want to let him go, and I think he's almost he's just he's not going to get dropped, is he? Ever? No. I mean, he's so important. Even when he's playing badly, you know he's going to score almost. Yeah. It's really weird. You look back to even the games when he played badly at the end of last season. Even that Stoke game when he ended up with two goals, or Man United at home when he scored the first goal. He's a goal scorer first and foremost, yeah, and a match winner. So yeah. you you know that's right. What I think what you're saying is, and I agree. You know, for 70 minutes you may see very little of him, and suddenly he steps up and does something brilliant, like the Palace game, for instance. Yeah. That absolute piece of genius. Um, in terms of what Neville was saying, he was talking uh, as well about how basically he he's like a throwback, an old school midfielder. He snaps into tackles just like yeah. you were saying. One minute he's in his own box, next minute he pops up in the opposition box. Must make him incredibly hard to defend against. Oh, you'd hate to play against him. And he's so athletic as well. I think a lot of the players say he's the 
fittest in the team. His mm -hmm. running stats are as good as anyone, I think, in the Tottenham team. Be interesting longer term to see his position. I really like him as a number 10, almost plays as a second striker, let's mm. be honest. Gets in behind, plays off the scraps. He's a finisher as well. Yeah. But he was just as impressive playing in that number eight, box to box. I mean, yeah. if you're comparing him to Pogba, Pogba is box to box. He likes the ball in the centre circle. Deli Ali can do that role, but I think you're losing the goals from him. And yeah. really, you want him in the final third where he can make the difference in game. And you're right. I'd compare him more to, you know, if your box to box is your Pogba or Gerard, I think he's more. The Frank Lampard, mm -hmm. Frank Lampard type, joined the final third late and scored plenty of goals. And there's no reason why he can't score 15 goals every season. Yeah, absolutely. And against Palace, I wonder, interest what you'd think. Would you be tempted after Janssen's performance to be brave, play Janssen, drop Harry into a number 10 and, and maybe take out Wanyama and put Delhi alongside Eric Dyer? I'd be tempted, but I probably wouldn't. Mm. I think more likely he'll start with the team he started with. That's the first team, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, minus I mean, Dembele, yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's the first team, I think. They need to build up their fitness and sharpness first. Janssen's shown he can be a great option off the bench, which is what Tottenham didn't have last season. Mm -hmm. You had the first 11, yeah. and then the problem was the backups when they came in. Yeah. That's where they dropped points, really. So I think he'll start with the same team, but Janssen's a great option, and he can move it around now, and that's the whole point. You bring in Wanyama, or you bring in Janssen, and you can fiddle things around, and you don't end up with Ryan Mason or Tom Carroll stuck in central midfield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Di and, but are, are Dyer and Wanyama too, a bit similar to play together? Neither of them kind of playing the pivot, really? I don't think they're... I think you've got Dyer or Wanyama as your holding player, yeah. and then you've got Dembele or Harry Winks or Deli Ali yeah. next to them, I think. Yeah, I think you're if right. If Pochettino's looking at it now, I think that's how I look at it, too. I think you're right. OK, on to some uh, transfer rumours. This Danny Drinkwater one has been floating around for a month or so. It strikes me as a bit ridiculous. Today, it's come out that he's rejected an £80,000 a week deal from Leicester, and somehow we are the ones linked with him. You know, especially having just discussed Wanyama and Dyer, it's just bullshit, isn't it? Yeah, agent talk. Mm. Agent talk. You just said it there. Player wants a new contract. They're in negotiations. Absolutely no chance of Tottenham signing Danny Drinkwater. There you go. That's exactly how concise <laughs> we like it. Pithy from Greg <laughs> Stobart from Scorgula. Perfect. And just to end off, DeAndre Yedlin. Now, I thought he looked pretty good. Uh, over in Australia in pre-season. He's obviously, let's be realistic, third choice right back. Uh, he did play left back a bit when he was over there as well. Do you think, A, there's any chance of him taking Trippier's role as kind of the squad right back, the reserve right back? Uh, and if not, um, do you think he'll uh, end up going to one of Sunderland, Derby or Hull? Sunderland or Hull, hopefully, more realistically. I think he'll go back to Sunderland, and it sounds like it's more likely to be a permanent deal than a loan with an option. But it's interesting that Pochettino still took him to Australia. He's had involved yeah. in the squad because the players he doesn't want, he's made it pretty yeah. damn clear he doesn't want them. Stay at home, lads. Chadley, Ventaleb. Yeah, you're, they're, f they're for sale, aren't they? Yeah. Quite clearly, Fazio's gone now. But with Yedlin, he obviously some sees something there, at least the work rate. I think he's a bit naive defensively. He improved under Allardyce, though, that's for sure. He yeah. definitely improved defensively. That's why I think, especially thinking, talking cynically about Tottenham's potential marketing in America, yeah. ideas in North America, maybe a loan would be a safer option. But yeah. I can see him going back to Sunderland. OK, there you go, guys. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Cheers Your debut Spurbert, I think. Uh, he'll be back for a Tottenham transfer talk towards the end of the deadline. Hopefully, we'll actually do something. Uh, Pochettino, I think, spoke about hopefully getting into uh, one, two, or maybe even three signings. I'm not sure about that. We'd have to let a few players go. But guys, let us know what you thought of everything we discussed uh, in the comments section below. How did you feel about the Everton game? Will Christian sign that contract? Greg says he will. That's good news. Um, the Paul Mitchell stuff, obviously. Gary Neville's thoughts on Delhi. We just call him Delhi now. Uh, Danny Drinkwater rumours. Is it bullshit? We think it is. And DeAndre Edden. Let us know what you think in the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter at Spurred on TV. And come on, you Spurs. To talk about the top. 10 summer signings oh, yeah, summer. of all time in the Premier League era. 